Um, I know many of you, but maybe not all of you. My name is Tina Olson, and I'm the director here at UMA, at the University of Michigan's Museum of Art. And I'm very, very delighted um, to welcome you to the very beginning of our convening, Free to Speak, a convening on art, slavery, and reconciliation, and the culminating event, really, of our presentation of our extraordinary exhibition, Hear Me Now, The Black Potters of Old Edgefield, South Carolina. The program, this whole program today, has a whole range of kind of intertwined goals. It's very much about uplifting artistic practice and celebrating diverse perspectives and inspiring institutions like our own uh, to consider our role in repairing racial injustices and other kinds of injustices too. That aligns very closely with our own strategic plan, which was created in 2022, which sets forth the goal of leading real change in museums rooted in equity, collaboration, and care. So we should all be listening for that today, to what extent we're really delivering um, on those ideas and those aspirations. The morning's, asp uh, the morning's program um, of Artists Speak um, will feature Theaster Gates um, and Adebumi Badibo. Uh, two extraordinary artists whose work is upstairs in the exhibition. And I, I know that maybe most of you have been through the, the exhibition upstairs, but for any who haven't, I strongly, absolutely encourage you to take advantage of some of the breaks in the program today to go upstairs two floors to see it. So each of them are going to talk very briefly, and then we're, we're going to follow with a public conversation that will be facilitated by Monica Montgomery. There'll be time for a Q&A. <clears throat> um, with the in-person audience. This is also being recorded, by the way, at the end. In just a moment, I'm going to hand over the microphone to Jason Young, a professor of history here at the U of M and co-curator of Hear Me Now, to formally introduce the guests. But I want to thank for a moment um, some of the many guests here in the audience, um, including the exhibition's co-curators. So Adrienne Spinozzi is here today from New York, from the Metro Metropolitan Museum of Art. She's the Associate Decorator of American Decorative Arts there. And so is Ethan Lasser, who's from the MFA Boston. Um, Ethan is the Chair of the Art of the Americas at the MFA. Um, Ethan and Adrian and Jason together co-curated the exhibition. Sylvia Yunt is also with us. Sylvia is the curator in charge of the Met's American Wing, where the exhibition debuted. I'm also grateful for all of the speakers in the afternoon's lightning round presentations, and especially um, the members of David Drake's family who have traveled with us um, and to participate in the program. And that's an extraordinary privilege for all of us to be with them. First, I have a couple of thank yous, several of our thank yous for the, for the institutions that helped pay for and fund and support the program. Uh, the UM Inclusive History Project, the University of Michigan Arts Initiative, the American, the Americana Foundation, uh, Michigan Humanities, the Chipstone Foundation, the University of Michigan's Office of Diversity, Equity, and, in Equity and Inclusion, the University of Michigan's Department of History, the University of Michigan's Department of Afro-American and African Studies, um, and today's program is part of the university-wide theme semester, Arts and Resistance. So that list, which can often feel like just something that kind of rotely gets read, that was a really important um, coalition of parts of the university that came together and acknowledged how important what we're doing today is. Thank you all for being here today. We have a very full day ahead of us. Um, I think you might have seen when you came in, the restrooms are right around the corner. There's a cafe up above us for cafe, so please come and go and make yourself feel comfortable so that we can all enjoy um, what's ahead of us. And now it's my pleasure to turn the microphone over to Jason, who will introduce our speakers. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> so a couple of days ago, we had like a final organizing meeting um, in advance of, of everything that's gonna happen today. And the, the energy in that room, just, just a couple of days ago, the energy in that room, the spirit in that room was such that I said something like, I feel like the kitchen is cooking, but it's not time to eat. <laughs> you know, 
feel like the kitchen is cooking, but it's not time to eat. And now, as I stand here, I, I have my plate and I see my seat. So, <laughs> so the only thing hap the only thing standing between me and the food is um, this task to, to introduce our speakers, which is an important task, but I wanna be brief so as to give us as much time as possible to enjoy, um, enjoy the reason why we're here today. And so I'm going to, to briefly introduce um, the three people who you'll see on stage in just a moment, and, um, and then we'll proceed. Let, let's, let's see what happens. Artist and social innovator Theaster Gates lives and works in Chicago, trained in urban planning and ceramics. His artistic practice translates the intricacies of blackness through space theory and land development, sculpture, and performance. His work focuses on the possibility of the life within things and redeems spaces that have been left behind. He is the founder of the Rebuild Foundation, an artist-led community-based platform for art, cultural development, and neighborhood transformation. Aribumi Barebo, a multimedia artist, explores the intersections of land, matter, and memory on sites of slavery using materials like indigo, dye, plantation soil, and black hair. She's a 2022 Pew Fellow, 2023 Maxwell and Henneron Fellow, and AIR at the Clay Studio in, in Philadelphia. But Abel's art resides in permanent collections at institutions such as the Smithsonian National Museum of African American Art and the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. She is currently designing a monument at Clemson University to honor enslaved laborers who transformed Fort Hill Plantation into the University of Clemson. Monica O. Montgomery is a museum thought leader and independent curator at the nexus of culture, community engagement, and equity. Known for curating social justice exhibits and founding diversity initiatives, um, Museum Hue, over the last two decades, she has served as an executive director, a fundraiser, a marketer, an educator, and a program director. Her career credits include a TEDx talk, a South by Southwest plenary, and over 40 curated contemporary art and public, public history exhibits, including at the South African Embassy, the Brooklyn Museum, Portland Art Museum, Community Art Center, T. Thomas Fortune Cultural Center, and the New School, uh, and the National Trust for Historic Preservation. I don't want to forget that one. Um, she um, has also included, the, the list is, is very long, um, the Weeksville Heritage Center and the Highline, among others. She served as the Curator of Social Justice and Special Programs for the Futures Exhibition at Smithsonian's Arts and Industries, organizing an interactive exhibit, exhibit, exhibit of art, technology, and history to celebrate the Smithsonian Institution's 175th anniversary. Um, please join me in welcoming all three. I believe that um, uh, Bunmi is gonna come to the stage first. Thank you. Good morning. <laughs> Um, I just want to first start off and acknowledge and thank the ancestors, the Edgefield Potters and Dave. Um, if it wasn't for their lives, we wouldn't be here. Um, and also thank Uma, the curators, um, Lisa, um, my co-panelists and moderator. Um, this event has already changed me, so I'm very grateful. Um, I usually start my talks off kind of talking about the trajectory of my work, but I'm gonna just land straight in at kind of what became the issue or kind of the dilemma in doing this work for me. Um, I guess a couple of years ago, just talking with family and just being naturally curious through my work and practice, um, I started to ask like, or trying to get a deeper understanding of my relationship to this land, to this country. And through stories with family, I realized that um, we still had a connection and my family knew the plantation where our family was enslaved. 
um, which was True Blue Plantation in Fort Mott, South Carolina, about 45 minutes from Columbia. So naturally, I just went and did deep dive and started researching, like, what can I learn and understand about this space? And some of the first documents and things that I was finding look like these. So you have, um, I guess, on the left, which is an appraisal list, where it lists my enslaved ancestors. And it's hard to make out, but this list you could see below that line, it says mules. At the very bottom, it says 60 head of cattle. This is an appraisal list of animals and humans and their prices. Um, I also kind of gleaned out a section of a will of Richard Singleton, who owned my family. He, um, my family was enslaved on Lang Syne, True Blue, and Singleton Plantation. And you could see in the language, um, it's kind of him um, kind of documenting the kind of inheritance of his descendants of my ancestors. And when I was finding these documents, and on one hand, I was like, oh my gosh, it's them. You know, to have a name or to see them being kind of um, visible within this history was just astounding. But also, there was this um, real anger and disturbance that I was finding my family in what many scholars called the violence of the archives or in these documents where they were listed as things to be inherited and traded and sold off to or appraised. Um, and I was really grappling, like, how do I deal with how my family is showing up? Um, and I think in a lot of ways, this show is kind of asking that same question. We have, we have the name of Dave, but then we have hundreds and possibly thousands of others where we don't have a name. We have these kind of unknown bodies and all we really have are vessels and almost like these broken bodies, broken clay bodies. So how do you tell a story of a people where all you have is a shard, broken bodies, um, and kind of humans that have been dehumanized in these archives? So I started um, thinking that maybe in the material I could kind of resolve this kind of dilemma. So I started taking cotton, thinking about cotton that's currently grown on True Blue, although this was an indigo and rice plantation with the collapse of that um, economy, the slave owners started to grow cotton. I started to take black hair and thinking of this material as literally our bodies, literally our DNA, and embedding them into the cotton, and then dyeing these sheets in um, indigo and pulverized denim and hair dyes and the color blue. And as an artist, I thought it was also really interesting that my relationship to a color was one of violence. So I was exploring um, this color, this history, these materials, um, and ending kind of the last layer of these sheets, I was silk screening these documents that I was finding. So here's a close up where I found another will where it lists humans, their age, and the role that they played on the plantation. Um, this document was a list of 185 enslaved people that totaled 370,000. Um, so, you know, I was kind of doing these sheets and also the act of paper making in a lot of ways, not only related to kind of the paper material in which um, my, um, these archives presented like the histories of my ancestors, but there's like a fragility um, and a delicacy in 
paper itself. So I was seeing this work as like kind of creating my own documents or my own archives, but I was still kind of feeling unresolved that in a lot of ways I was still um, just um, representing these violent archives, you know, not really transforming them much, you know. Um, so in doing further, further research, I came across this article. And this article really, like, um, I guess, changed my life and my practice. And it was about this man named Jackie Whitmore who had been caring for in, um, these burial grounds on True Blue, on Lang Syne, on Singleton Plantation. Um, and it had a number at the bottom of the article. So I called this guy and he was like, oh yeah, we cousins. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, and I was like, oh, wow, okay. Um, and it's it's kind of a joke because I'm like, how are we related every time I meet him? And I'm like, I need to actually write it down. Um, but this was a really turning point because now I had a person who knew this space, who was caring for this space. And when the world shut down in 2020, um, also, I was going through my own kind of levels of loss. Um, I had four family members that died in a year, including my mother in that year. Um, so visiting this burial ground on this plantation just felt like a thing to do in this moment. So I went to True Blue. I drove down to South Carolina with two friends. Um, and this was like kind of what you arrive at, these acres of cotton fields um, still owned by the slave owning family and the, 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 the overseers of True Blue. Each these fields are kind of flanked with the street signs bearing their names. And I just remember as we're driving miles and miles and miles down these continuous roads of cotton fields, who cleared this land? Who defined this land? Um, you know, they say that there was so much land cleared to grow these crops, to kind of form these plantations that you could see it from space. There was more land moved to create these plantations than the pyramids in Egypt. And where is the people who did this work? Um, and that answer a lot is in these woodlands. Um, so when you go into these woodlands, what you find are these burial grounds. Girl, I think you should have said this. So you know Val Davis, right? Uh -huh. Diana, this is granddaddy in here. And that's the grandma. I want to mute it for a sec. When you so at the entrance of this burial ground, and this specifically is True Blue burial ground. Um, it's a seven-acre cemetery of the slaves started in the 1600s. But a lot of what is clear and the fact that we could walk through and see headstones intact is because of the work of this man, Jackie Whitmore, my cousin, who's like in that green. Um, kind of um, shirt. But as you go deeper and deeper into this burial ground, the land looks like this. That's beautiful. And this is our attempt of just finding headstones that go back a hundred years, two hundred years, three hundred years, and you could imagine the kind of loss um, and almost it feels like the impossibility to find the literal thousands, there's thousands of bodies buried in this cemetery. I'm gonna like 
just go through some of the kind of um, realities of this cemetery. Um, some bodies are only marked by broken shards. Some headstones are completely severed. Um, there's a headstone here. Um, before I used to highlight where it is, but I think the fact that it's hard to see where this headstone is, is kind of the reality of, you know, the kind of um, level of erasure and impossibility. Some headstones have completely tumbled over. This is a tabby headstone, which is really significant because you see a lot of these tabby kind of building materials on the coast. So for me, this was an indication that not only were bodies transported um, and dispersed throughout the Carolinas in this state, but also um, their techniques for building. Um, but again, you could barely make out who's um, buried here. There's all these kind of major craters in the land of bodies that have decomposed. Um, and this is a direct descendant. If you know anything about South Carolina, just to say the name Ravenel is like, you understand um, the kind of um, history that that name brings. Um, but this is my great, great, great uncle William Ravenel. And I remember just, you know, seeing the cotton fields and seeing the kind of um, realities of the headstones and being in the cemetery and thinking, like even what exists is endangered of being completely erased by the land and engulfed. And I came across this essay that I think really kind of um, became foundational in my thinking. And it says, I'll quickly read it, nearly everywhere on earth sand is principally made up of one element. In some places silica and others limestone. 90% of grain is almost always just one of these two elements. But the other 10% is the percentage of, with the difference, the percentage that in its difference matters, the percentage that could tell us something about the history of a place. And this was in an essay by Vanessa A. Gard Jones, What the Sand Remembers. And this was really pivotal for me because I think in the ways that I felt really challenged in how to represent and find kind of more holistic stories of my ancestors and their humanities and lives, I realized through this essay and through other research that I could go directly to the land that what exists in this place, all that has happened, all that the trees have witnessed and gone back into the land, all the blood, the sweat, their flesh is all in this land, captured in that 10%. So I went to the land. And I, not only was I mesmerized by, this is an unedited um, image, um, of that soil. There's also kind of an image um, of this land in the show upstairs. Um, but it was kind of the turning point in my practice where I realized that I could take this soil that bears my ancestors' bodies where they were enslaved and form it into clay. I could claim this land and shape it um, into any form of my kind. And I remember when making this transition and in the studio, um, I remember at one point thinking like, what am I gonna make of this land? And it hit me that me as a descendant, I have a choice. I could form this land in any way, in a way that my ancestors didn't. Um, so just the freedom to do that was just the blessing that I have. Um, so I did that. And I also was also curious, what other ways did this land hold the memory of my ancestors? And Jackie took me to this school um, that's on Langzine Plantation that was built by Eleanor Roosevelt and Julie Peterkin, a famous American author who wrote about my ancestors in her Pulitzer Prize winning book. 
but this school was made for the first generation of um, dis of newly emancipated um, black children of the plantation. Um, about 45 minutes at another, another kind of educational institution at University of South Carolina is the McCord House. Um, Louisa McCord sent my enslaved ancestors to USC's campus, which is um, well known, has been built by enslaved labor to build this house that was used as a hospital um, during the Civil War. Um, and through Jackie's research, he identified John Spann and Anderson Key at the, as the enslaved contractors who built this home. Um, and I started collecting parts of the home, of the school, and another space I'll get to. And seeing the balustrades of this balcony of the McCord House um, as significant. You know, these were objects that were being discarded through the renovation of the house. But for me, they bared the craftsmanship, the hand, the labor, the lives. They were evidence that my ancestors were here. So I started using kind of these discarded architectural elements um, and presenting them like in exhibition spaces. Um, there was also a church. Um, that my newly emancipated ancestors built the first institution they built with their freedom um, that's currently a hunting club owned by the overseers of True Blue. Um, but this, and just this lock is just an example of the kind of trespassing I had to do just to get that image. Um, and I'm not gonna play, I usually play, there's a video of me where I almost got caught trespassing. Um, and you could hear like in that kind of reality of like, oh my gosh, I think someone caught me trespassing at this hunting club on True Blue Plantation. Um, you hear in the video me kind of like <sighs> running. Um, and there was a moment in that where I realized Oh, I've done this before. The kind of fear that was present in my body, I felt I've done this before. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna play the video um, for time's sake. And, but I was lucky enough and blessed enough to inherit the original church views built in 1890. Um, and every time I've exhibited these pews, there's a descendant that I've never met, a family member that's like, I heard about your show and I think we're related. Um, so this is a curator that I didn't know, Terrence Washington, that I realized um, we were family. And this is us um, sitting on the bench. Um, and in kind of working with the land, I also started to realize that I am an archive. We are an archive. You know, we, we've come, we were taken from Africa with nothing, but what we, they couldn't take is our relationship to the land, our skills, our techniques. So I um, intentionally have been building all these ceramic works using indigenous coil building techniques. And this is kind of the lineage of the, the Cooley woman from Ghana who taught that technique to Winnie Owens, who taught that technique to Jahan Thomas, who taught that technique to me. And these are some examples of the works that I've made with that land. Um, you could see like in the middle piece, sometimes I'll literally break the vessels and put them back together. And I like to think of kind of my practice as one of piecemealing these histories using black hair as almost like the gold that is holding this land together. I think a lot about function and the edge filled potters and how those vessels served a function to hold food. So I'll sometimes embed it with, with actual Carolina gold rice, um, sometimes embedding them with black hair, literally inserting ourselves back into this history, back into this land. Um, 
or how to play with function, you know, and kind of turn it upside down, that this vessel is holding food, but in a way that is really questioning kind of function. Um, this is an image of the piece that is upstairs. Um, and I use a pit fire technique to finish the work because I like to think that the last kind of process of how these works are completed take on a sort of burial and the flame and the smoke leaves kind of this memory of imprint on the surface on the back onto the clay and in, also when thinking a lot about um, Dave Drake's um, work and kind of the archive I started to look at the stoneware his vessels as these primary sources, as like his kind of journal entries where he was in first person documenting his experience, his life as an enslaved person in real time at the precise moment that he was forcibly doing that labor. Um, so it started to kind of shift my thinking that these headstones were also a sort of document or archive. Um, and I started titling all the pieces after the in full inscription of the headstone. Um, and they often had these poems. So there was kind of this beautiful like relationship or conversation between the headstones, these stone headstones and these stoneware objects of Dave. Here's um, an image of um, a cemetery cleanup. And I started to realize that memory work and was also similar to like what the Aster was saying last night about just the act of sweeping is kind of transforming something that's been discarded into sacred that these cemetery cleanups and coming back to the land um, to care for them and to um, continuously co keep that connection was a sort of memory work. And this was um, a cleanup that had about 170 descendants and a volunteer of a high school students removing trees and kind of literally bringing up headstones that have been buried and kind of almost lost. Um, my relatives have been buying back parts of the cemetery and getting historical markers placed so that we will not forget what took on this place. And that, I guess my memory work has expanded to kind of bring forth the memory of other spaces and other plantation. So this is my work working with students at Clemson University, which was originally Calhoun's Fort Hill Plantation, where 700 unmarked bodies of the enslaved and the convict laborers who transformed this plantation into um, a university were found in unbarked burials. So we've been looking at brick making and using the land again to tell these stories of this space. And I'll just close that I, I feel like in a lot of ways my work is memory work, but I, it also is in memory of work. Um, the ways in which I was dealing with Pers with loss of like history and ancestors, I was also dealing with my own sets of losses. So I'm just gonna, in memory of my ancestors and the ancestors of Edgefield. I was going to talk a little bit about uh, something that seems uh, modest relative to the excavation work you've been doing for me, so thank you. I wanted to talk about the show that Ethan Lasser and I did together in Milwaukee through Chipstone. Thank you, Ethan. It feels important uh, for me to talk about it a little bit because um, as I was suggesting last night, it was 
it was the moment when I was trying to um, create a through line between my life as a potter, my interest in conceptual forms that could be legible to the art world and trying to find a place for my feelings uh, that Dave in some way was being misrepresented or the creative enslaved people of the Americas, the only voices they had to speak for them were their enslavers or the descendants of their enslavers. So I was, and so I thought I would just show you a little bit from this exhibition, and if you'll pardon my cold, I don't know, when was this, Ethan? 2000, 2010. At the time, amplification of Dave's life was the thing that was on my mind. And I had been given a residency at Kohler the year prior, some time before, and I wanted to use my time at Kohler to think about contemporary ceramic labor. These were generational union white guys, German, in Sheboygan Falls, who were on the assembly line making Kohler products. And I got my residency, and I would tell these, these men, they started at 4 a.m., I would go in at 4 a.m. with them, and over time we built a rapport, and they would say, well, what are you, what are you doing with all these sinks? I said, oh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about this potter named Slave, you know, this, this potter named Dave, and he was enslaved in this period. And, um, and I started referring to the, the, the cull, they call it cull at Kohler, the kind of uh, recycle ceramic porcelain, the liquid porcelain that they use. When it doesn't work, they call it cull. It's a waste product. And the more I talked about Dave on the assembly line with these cats, and these were like the mold makers, or the, 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 the producers of folk who were glazing, kind of taking things off the line, taking it to the kiln. This one brother said, my white brother said, um, you know, he saw me put nigger wear on one of these things, wrote it out, nigger wear. And he said, you know, we used to get bonuses when we would have innovations on the line. So if, let's say, a mold didn't work and they couldn't get a part out, on the line you would have to figure out, uh, how do I keep this thing from sticking? Because if I have too much coal, they might uh, dock my pay. So you used to get paid for innovations. And if there were innovations that sped up the process, so if you could make 20 sinks an hour and you move that to 25 sinks an hour, Somebody would get paid, everybody would be expected to move to 25 an hour, and then 25 an hour, 25 cents an hour became the new standard. White boy says, sometimes I feel like a nigger too. And it was like this moment when uh, craft felt like a kind of strange, late, the labor, the labor inherent in the work of the hand and the innovations that are possible when a person sees a problem over and over and kind of engages with that. I became very interested in this stuff, Bumi. And, you know, a big part of the exhibition was trying to make sense of this history and then the ceramic futures. And so with some of these works, I started to just, you know, uh, I just, I didn't use my signature anymore. I just started signing Dave, like, like, as, like, in a Japanese tradition where, like, I would lose my name. And it's like, actually, my name doesn't matter. Raku is the name that matters, you know. Riku is the name that matters, you know. And, 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 I, and I was transposing this kind of Japanese kind of the hierarchy of name. I was putting that on Dave, and I was like, actually, does the Astra matter? You know, Dave, and then it was like, well, if I throw Dave on there as the sign, and the Astra on there as a signature, me and Dave could come up together. We could make this work. 
I just became really preoccupied with this question of what it means to sign something and what it means to be signed by someone, to, to have one's life signed away. But the, the thing that comes to mind for me, you know, just kind of in, in, in reflection on, your, on this beautiful gift that you have of being able to identify your family, know this location uh, in the United States, and then meet family as a result of the site, is that in a way we, we add value to our lives by giving shape and form and receiving the forms of the truth of our past. And I, I didn't realize when I was studying ceramics in Iowa that I would care so much about blackness through the vessel or that I would come to care so much about our histories through this thing that was kind of just catharsis at first and a good way to give cheap Christmas presents to a big family. <laughs> I was like, I could make one for Marisa, Gertrude, Glenda, Robin, Kelly. And it's just like, you know, all eight of my sisters could get something and all 26 of their kids. <laughs> I had to make a lot of pots. I had to make a lot of pots just to get through Christmas. You know, I was a production potter for my family. You know. um, but I think that when you, when you look at the tremendous... Uh, amplification that's been happening, especially around Dave, but also the lives of South Carolinian potters and, and, and the interest, the growing interest in ceramics writ large. Um, it, it, it hardens me because I think in so many ways, um, I couldn't have imagined that the exhibition in 2010 would lead to ongoing research would lead to the location of family members, would lead to uh, new areas of scholarship and, um, and ways that clay feels more meaningful and more adjacent to young black and brown people because they can now name names and know that we are not simply biting the canons of white American culture, but that we've been active participants for a very long time. And it's kind of like, you know, he's like, I don't want to play golf because golf wasn't made for me. And then you realize that like, oh shit, we may have invented golf. <laughs> and then it's like, all of a sudden you got a new relationship with the sport. You know what I mean? And I think that Clay, we have been involved with the material of the earth from the beginning of time. Shame on us and shame on that work of erasing and eradicating and removing. Shame, shame on that kind of historical warfare that happens, that tries to erase the thing. So I sign things now so that they know. Here we are. Let's talk together. Thanks so much. Wow. Let's give another hearty round of applause for these impactful artists. I am blown away. And I admit all of my pre-formatted questions, I have totally new questions, but we're going to juxtapose <laughs> the ones that you got and the ones that just came up in the moment. I'm going to start with just what came up in the moment from both of your presentations so much. It seems like both of you have this practice that centralizes care and community care and the gathering of folks, of souls, thinking about music and choirs and vocal arrangements, thinking about cemetery cleanings and the genealogy and ancestor tracing that leads you to family, right, through your exhibitions and beyond. And then what you said, Theaster, about erasing and eradicating the historical warfare. You talked about the violence of the archives. How are these forms of community care helping to reclaim space and commemorate, and how can they continue 
to help. Um, it's interesting. When I was listening to you talk about the signature, I, I was thinking about how on one hand we have Dave's signature, which is, I think, a miracle. Um, and then we have hundreds, thousands of other enslaved potters in which we don't. And on one hand, there's like this beauty and this tremendous act of resistance and what Dave was doing, but it also, in a way, like separates him from everyone else. It, um, it makes him like this like phenomenal Negro. <laughs> uh -huh. um, and then on the other hand, in the ways in which we don't have the names and signatures of the thousands, maybe even millions of other enslaved potters, they form a sort of community. Um, so in thinking about the signature, I was thinking about how it kind of divides one as kind of being alone and then this community. Um, and just thinking of the process of how these pots came to be the kind of communal work um, you know, like there was someone digging the clay yeah. and, f and kneading the clay and making the glazes and building the, cl the, the, the kiln bricks and cutting down the trees. Like this, it, all, this whole history is about community. Um, none of this could have happened. Even what Dave was doing could not have happened without community. And I think, um, in that, like, just community is just found, like, none of my work could happen without community, without my cousin Jackie, without the, the, the people who come in for the cemetery cleanup. And um, it's just, it's, like, when I think about Dave, like, there's, there's this beauty, but it's also a bit of a sadness because he often gets sometimes like kind of severed in the way we think about his legacy from his community that um, I'm sure not just supported the physical labor, but the emotional um, kind of turmoil that it would, would, it would require to kind of endure decades of that type of violence. Yeah, um, I'll come back to the community, but another way of thinking about Dave, maybe instead of the kind of lone artistic genius, that, that maybe he was also a portal, mm -hmm. like a door, so that so we're all in this room, the room isn't all doors. Relative to the size of the room, the doors take up 5% of the room. Mm -hmm. But the, the door gets you through into other rooms. Mm -hmm. And the other rooms have other things that are interesting, like Korean ceramics. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, that beautiful yellow, <laughs> that golden tone, red iron on a, a light white celadon. That maybe Dave, was an intentional m per marker, moment, character in history meant to act as the door that substantiates the truth that all those other bodies, skilled people, more talented, somebody trained they, co-workers, co-conspirators in the the work, I think about Dave like that. And then I think, you know, uh, 
the reason I keep coming back to ceramics, especially as my contemporary art life grows, is because it needs others. You need others mm -hmm. to do it. To do, to do what I want to do well, you need others. And in the art world, you don't really mention their names, the others. Mm -hmm. I got a team of white folk that help me do things. I don't say their names. <laughs> So I'll be remembered. <laughs> so now I talk about Katie <laughs> and Nick and Jesse and Jordan Taylor. And Jordan introduced me to my brick guys in South Carolina and Gavin Chura and Koichi Ohara. And I say people's names because I'm not interested in that modernist mm -hmm. ethos of leaving people out. And I'm not interested in that colonial ethos mm -hmm. of leaving people out. So I say their names. Yeah. I'm proud that I work with potters from all over the world. Yeah. And that together we can do a thing and that I can put people on and get them shows, and, you know, and build a community. I'm glad that the Black Monks is not the Astor Gates and the Black Monks, those musicians are way talented, more, more talented than me. But like through this little thing that I have access to, because I get to be this portal, mm. we get to walk through things together. So I feel like there is a kind of, um, there's a weeness that seems a bit more inherent in blackness. And, and, and they're, they're, when, I, when I think about other histories, like a British mechanized, like manufactured ceramics. So, so in a way, the thing that we're doing, of being a studio potter, that's a recent tradition. The, the isolated individual potter, people talk about this in British ceramics. Because you had workshops and artisanal groups, you know, um, but the individual potter, that's probably like 1880s, 1920s. You know, like before that, it was like, you know, you work for a company, y'all do stuff together. Wedgwood, like Josiah Wedgwood was an important kind of innovator and entrepreneur around ceramic technologies. But I feel like, you know, we, we there was a kind of collaborative thing. And then in a way, uh, modernity created this desire to create the individual artist, the individual artisan. And I think we, we know Dave's name because the Landrum plantation was smart enough to know that his name meant more than theirs. Mm -hmm. And that when they would loan him out and that pot had his name on it, it, it you know, he was like Nike. He was our, he was the Air Jordan of Nike. <laughs> yeah. Know? I really believe that, you know, I'm, I'm trying to imagine like Dave as an early brand. And that maybe he had some sense of that so he could get fresh with it. Anyway. Well, piggybacking on that, on weeness, right? And the, the show and, and the conversations that <laughs> historians are having <laughs> of things that happened in the past and the realities of the slave past always coming back up in the present, uh, very present in your work as well. How can the resilience that black people have shown despite it all in relation to the complicated, fraught racial lineages of slavery and plantation economies, how can the resilience of the echoes of the enslaved makers continue to be honored in your art practice and the art practice of others that are coming up alongside you um, and after you? I guess. Hmm. You want to go? Well, I was, it just made me think of uh, Rock, the person, the first question that was asked last night. You know, um, obviously not of color, or seemingly not of color, but super invested in the way culture shapes future, right? And so I think that that for me. 
it is, I no longer have to embody Dave or Yamaguchi or uh, but I like that there is this thing called art and there are these places called museums where uh, in addition to Jason being a historian in the history department, that Jason's historical research has another home where the things of history might be exposed. And that you need both the history department over there, and then you need this other place where the thing could show up. And because the thing is to show up, it means that the person who may not read Jason's book might see the evidence of the truth of his research. And so I think it's important for us as artists to help the thing emerge if we can. Like the, the buried, the, the tombstone is buried with the body. It's important to bring that thing back up so that we can say, ah, a body is here. Our bodies were here. And I feel like sometimes art is simply the manifestation of the truth of things, the truth of our thinking, the truth of our encounters with others, the truth of our past. Like, I never would have imagined in a million years that I would be making paintings from my dad's tar kettle. Mm -hmm. But by choosing to make tar paintings, I proved that my dad lived, mm -hmm. and that his work wasn't in vain. You know, I think about one of the earliest vessels we have of Dave was signed the same year that the oldest ancestor my family has been able to find was born in wow. South Carolina. Wow. When Dave signed that vessel, Rareson Ravenel was born. Wow. Just hours apart from each other, you know, and in ways that Dave was resisting this, like, this law that said, you cannot write. Yeah. Rearson escaped slavery. Yeah. That was an ancestor that was able to emancipate himself. Yeah. So I feel like just us doing the work, it brings all those stories through. Yeah, it does. You know, our, our parents, all the losses, Dave, those potters, it, it brings everything through. And that's why I, I use, I'm like, this church pew? Yeah. This pew says we were here. Yeah. This pew says, look at that craftsmanship. Look at the width of that seat. Look at yeah. how, imagine how large that tree was. Look at the curve of that, of that arm. It says everything. It doesn't have a name signed to it, but it, it it's evidence of all of that. Yeah. And I think, you know, when I look at your work and like the work that I'm doing and just like giving or seeing the sacred in an object, you know, in a collection, in a magazine, you know, the 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 jet pup, like all the it's like all these things are sacred. Yeah. I sometimes tell a story that when, when I when I first went to, to Tokoname, uh, yeah, I was making this tea bowl. And this dude was so, he was so emphatic, like, why are you making a Japanese tea bowl? And I was like, because I'm in Japan and I paid money to be here and I'm going to learn, <laughs> I'm going to learn how to make a Japanese tea bowl before I leave this mug. You know, <laughs> you know? and he was like, but you're from Mississippi. Mm -hmm. There are great potters in Mississippi. You should make a Mississippi bowl. Mm -hmm. It's like, I gotta go all the way across the damn world <laughs> to learn. for a Japanese cat to tell me to go to Mississippi. <laughs> but it was, it, was, it was like, you could tell he was so proud of his jam that he wanted to see that same mm -hmm. pride. He wanted to learn from me about Mississippi as much as he wanted to share with me whatever he had about Japan and whatever I wanted to learn. And it took me a minute, and this is the, this is the psychological undoing, the kind of phenomenistic work of decolonializing. I had to believe that there was something good in Mississippi 
that I might be able to teach somebody. I had to believe that collard greens matter. <laughs> I had to believe that pot liquor, who's saying pot liquor? Pot liquor. I, had to go, I had to believe that the juices of our people were worth making a container for. Thinking about um, you know, the, the brilliance of home, right? And how sometimes we overlook what is local, what is familiar, um, and then go somewhere else and realize the beauty that is and was there. How is your practice expanding and elaborating on home and the local? And what tensions are you aiming to heal in your own conception of home and in others' conception of home? Yeah. So home for me is New Jersey. <laughs> Um, you know, obviously my family is from South Carolina by way of Brooklyn, by way of Jersey. <laughs> but, um, you know, we would go, we would do family reunions everywhere to the South, but that wasn't home. That was where my grandpa's from. That's where my grandma's from. Um, that wasn't my home. Um, and... What actually, I guess, pointed me to look at South Carolina more was I was losing the people that connected to my home. Um, I was also inheriting hair, because hair, using hair has always been foundational to my work. And the donations were coming with stories of people's lives and family and um, home. And I was just like, well, really, what is my relationship to this place? And it, it started to expand the way I was thinking about home. Like, what is my relationship to this land? Um, and it, that's what kind of brought me to think about um, that it all started on this plantation. It was interesting because... I mean, a plantation is a place of trauma, is a place of violence. Um, but because now this land is where I get my material, it's become home. It's become a sacred place. You know, this burial ground surrounded, like literally to step outside of that cemetery, I am automatically in danger. I am automatically fearful. But now there's like a way in which me using that land, me claiming that land back, I'm like, oh no, I'm going back. I'm doing a video. I'm doing a performance piece on this road. I'm about to steal this cotton. This is our cotton, which I have. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> um, you know, this is, this is our burial ground. This is where my ancestors lay. So I think, and, and from that space, like feeling ground, literally grounded on this ground, I've been able to kind of, it's like my practice has legs now. And I've been able to go to Stony Bluff Plantation mm. and be able to connect, like, no, this is ours. Yeah. This, Dave is us and we are him. This is our space you know, or going to Clemson, like I could see the sacred, I could see that that same home feeling mm -hmm. in other spaces. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would love to um, ask a, a, a last question as the audience with their burning question prepares to come to either of the mics on either side of the room if you'd like to ask a question of our artist, you're welcome to get information and line up. Um, but while they're doing that, this convening has been called Free to Speak and named intentionally so because we want those who are here, right, to feel free to speak. We have a series of very energizing, amazing lightning talks that are gonna start at one in the museum that we want folks to come to and interact with and share their take on the show, on the work, and on these themes. But what is it that you want to leave us with? What do you feel free to speak in terms of your art, your presence here today, and the legacy you're leaving in the world? 
And I'll start with you, Theaster, since you deferred the last question. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, it just feels like, you know, the, the past, I mean, I, I never thought that my practice would be so preoccupied with the past. And, and in a way, it, it, to, a, to a living person, it would seem like freedom is in the future. That, that a certain kind of freedom, we can't, we can't imagine it because we haven't, we haven't lived it in, in a certain past. And so, the more that we talk about the past, the more I sense something liberating. And it may even be that we're helping to liberate, we're participating in the energy of liberation of our ancestors. And by exonerating, it, by optimistically exhuming, by bringing up their lives and buffing off their headstones and putting their names there and accounting by number for the truth of their existence, we are helping to build freedom for the past. And that if I can be a participant in post-emancipatory practices, post-ordained, past-driven, emancipated. If I could help name an ancestor, put a headstone on my great-grandmama's grave, that, that this world might honor her, it feels like a reasonable janitorial task. And I would rather be a janitor for the past than a innovator of the future. I'm I'm happy, I'm I'm happy to be in this mix. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know. I struggle with that question. <laughs> Well, we certainly have time for audience questions, although I have a dozen more myself. But if there are folks that would like to ask, please come to the mic. Look to your left. OK, we'll start here on the left. I don't really have a question. I just want to be thankful that you honor my ancestor, that he's not a question mark anymore. <sighs> and I love the song, Dave. It brought tears to my eyes. And the young lady. I 70, I can't remember your name, but you're so beautiful. And to actually take that much interest in your history makes me proud. Mm -hmm. Okay? <laughs> My name is uh, Michelle Jara McKinney from Detroit. I work at, yes, Detroit, <laughs> Detroit's in house. <laughs> Um, it was just um, an honor and a, a pleasure and a learning to uh, be uh, in your presence and listen to what you say. I wanted to ask about community. As a memory worker, I'm an archivist and a librarian. Uh, I work at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History. Yeah. <laughs> And I'm also a part-time, uh, I'm the director of a music archives, a new music archives in Detroit. Wow. And the, the thing about community is that you say that they don't understand that they are worthy of, of telling their own story. And it's been a difficulty, you know, uh, working in archives to have people come and bring their their headstones, their their stories, and let them live in this uh, repository, which is like the you know a place that's foreign. It's not their basement. It's not their attic. It's not. They don't have control over it. And there's a lack of trust, as well as a, a lack of a sense of worth. And so, 
I'm grateful for the conversations that I've been listening to because you've given me language in which to talk to them about that, that kind of thing that, that if we don't reclaim it, who's going to, and yeah. that um, uh, dusting off those headstones and, and finding those graves of the people who shoulders we're standing on. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm just wondering, is there, how did you, how did you come to uh, be convicted of the worth of your family that you went and, and did the genealogical work mm. to find them? How did you go and, and uh, discover Dave's pot? I mean, and, and the, that worth that it meant to you? I, I don't know how to engender that in the people that are here now and who are underserved. I, I, I have a couple of things. This actually is gonna change my energy a bit. This is <laughs> So, uh, I'm always thinking about, uh, like I live on the south side of Chicago, I'm from the west side of Chicago. Um, parts of the city, thank you, parts of the city that uh, have seen better days, say. But if you think about the, the kind of uh, architectural image of a block, or the businesses that are there, without being stereotypical, you might have, let's say, a cell phone shop, uh, a fast food restaurant, a barber shop, a, a, a beauty supply situation, <laughs> and a currency exchange. Currency exchange. And a currency exchange. And y'all call it something else in Detroit. <laughs> Um, we would not imagine that a repository for our things would be part of the natural landscape of black space, right? So where do you put your things when your uncle dies? When your great aunt dies, where did, where did the things go? Um, and if those things don't have a certain kind of value or significance, if they have value, the family gonna know exactly what to do, they're gonna take it. But if, if, if they're seemingly just old stuff, then it goes to the garbage of the thrift store. You know, if somebody's dutiful, it divides among the family members if you know, somebody wants that old straightening comb or something. So, but I remember going into a Harold's Chicken Everybody in Harold's knew exactly how to order what they wanted. They would walk up to the window and they'd be like, can I get a seven piece, half perch, half chicken, uh, mild sauce on the side with two pieces of white bread on the left side, not the right side, because that's where the fries is. <laughs> and we were so familiar, we're so familiar with the forms of our chicken shack that the chicken shack never has to ask, you know, do you know how to order? Or, the culture of Starbucks has trained us so that if you want a frappuccino, no latte hate, you know, <laughs> that there's a way to articulate that and that Starbucks culture has trained us to do that. And I think that the challenge of the Black History Museum is that there's been, while we are the repositories, we haven't always built the cultural methodologies that would make the invitation to bring your great uncle's things to our repository and the truth that that stuff's gonna be all right for a long period of time and a, 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 a way. When you walk up to the front door, what happens? If you wanna drop off the stuff, you know, sometimes people just drop off Ebony magazines at the Arts Bank. They just, they just, they just, put, they just put it out on the front. You know, in, in the rain, in the snow, you know, my, anything. And so I, I think that we are at the beginning of rebuilding our libraries and repositories because when we were doing that in Egypt, uh, those things were burned and pillaged and we, we forgot technologies that we've had for tens of thousands of years. <laughs> but in this new Jack version, I feel like part of it is not just the creation of the home for the thing, but the creation, the development of relationships so that we know how to get from everyday people 
who just love what their great aunt had to the institutional repositories that are gonna hold it. And I think that's a work that we we haven't fully started even. That we have to we gotta figure that out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's that's what I'm saying. Yeah, it makes me think of like for the last ten years I've been receiving care. Yeah. From strangers, family, people in different countries. And there's like I guess this like and it's interesting because there's a level of trust, but sometimes I never met the person. So it's not like that was established. Um, but I think there's like this deep understanding that this thing that I had, that I kept in my closet or in my dresser or just threw out or the barbershop was going to get rid of, in my possession, it will be cared for, it will be considered. Um, it could be, it will be seen and honored in spaces like this. Um, and there's just that understanding that like with me, like that's what you're going to get. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that's the trust that's established without me even having to know the person. Um, so like even yesterday, someone was like, Oh, I'm, I, I know where to, to give my hair to. I'm going to give it to you. And that happens all, um, all of the time. Um, so it just made me think of just, like, I've become a repository for people literally sending me parts of themselves. They trust you. Thank you. We have time for two more questions. Uh, and there's so much more to discuss, but that's why you have to join us at <laughs> 1 o'clock for the lightning round talks. Yes. Uh, good morning. First, foremost, you guys are amazing. Um, and I'm saying that because, thank you, please give me a hand. There, both amazing. <laughs> to change someone's thought process about something is an amazing thing to do. And your talks on community and the work and the community work of how Dave, <clears throat> things came together, I had not thought about that in that way. And it touched me in a different way, maybe look at it differently. The question I wanted to ask you is this. As artists, when you're making something, you have a thought process in mind. When you finish it, what are one, and this is probably hard to put into one or two things, but what do you want people to walk away from when they see your art? What is the feeling you want them to have or the thought process from seeing your work? How, what are you trying to convey to them in that process? You know, this is, it's actually, this is actually such a complicated and, and beautiful question, but it's, it's complicated. Uh, the thing that the thing I want to say first is that you know an artist you exhibit for different reasons or different exhibitions mean different things to you you know so the, my project on Dave is unlike anything I've ever done you know like the work of that project was to try to lift someone's name up out of obscurity. It, it was an intentionally about the amplification of somebody who I didn't ever meet, but I knew was important for the future of art. And so the, the art project then was kind of a, it was a propaganda campaign, uh, you know, and, that, that, and I was using as many forms, I was, forms that maybe I had used before, but some I was totally unfamiliar with, like, a wall of speakers, and in it, it's just like, day, 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 day. You know? It's just like, say his name, you know? It's like, so. <clears throat> but that, that you know, and, and there are times when I, I think, like, I like using propaganda. I'm saying propaganda. What I mean is, is there a device that after the show, people are like, huh, where can I learn some more? You know, and it's like, I want them to never forget his name in 2010. And it was just, it was also like, because if they don't forget Dave's name, they won't forget that there's living black potters like me. That, 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 that it was, there was also something selfish in it. That like, if y'all, if, if we can acknowledge that Dave is important, we can acknowledge that the field is important. If we can acknowledge that the field is important, we might go back to Dave's field you know, that place. So if ceramics is important, we might go back 
And, they, and people went back. Y'all went to Edgefield. Now, Edgefield is differently important. It, it, it'll never be unimportant again. That's amazing. But that's a very different reason. Like, so, so in that sense, the show, the, the exhibition was a tool for communicating the power of this historical figure that we might then become excited about other historical figures. And I think for me, and first off, it's just really an honor that days, like you're here, you, yeah. I, I was, t I told you in the gallery yesterday, I feel like everybody in your family look alike. Yeah. <laughs> like y'all got some strong yeah. genes. So I feel like looking at you is the closest example of us knowing what Dave may have looked like. Um, and I feel really honored that you could even see our work. Um, so thank you just for being here. Um, but I think like my like work that just, I'm like, I could use this cotton and tell a story about us. I could use this grain of soil and tell a story about us. I could use this balustrade that's about to be thrown out, tell a story about us. I could use hair dye from Kim's Beauty Supply and tell a story about us. I could take these ripped jeans. Like, I think I want people to walk away and know that every, Anything we could use, we could see ourselves in anything. We could tell our stories through everything. That everything is important. Everything is sacred. And maybe if we start to look at um, this soil as a way to tell our story, these shards as a way of telling our story, we could have a different relationship with the land. Um, with this earth, with each other, um, and, and things could start to shift. So I just hope that when people see the work, they see, especially in my kind of way that I, I, I'll be like, I'm about to use, I'm, I'm about to do a piece about like water. I call it the invisible material. You know, it's necessary to make clay, to make paper, um, but that all elements, all objects can, be the starting point to tell our stories. And I think that's important, like I was sharing, because we sometimes, as like historians or scholars or something, will go to that appraisal list. And it's like, I'm not, I don't, that's important, but I don't want to ground the stories about us in a document that says, John, $150. You know, I, I want to ground it in this broken pot or this signature or this strand of hair, yeah. you know, and kind of transpose that kind of violence. Thank you. Thank you. And our last question. Yes. Hi. Um, so I'm going to take a note from last night, and I, con I connect it with the other person behind <laughs> me, and I combined our questions a little bit. I'm going to try. What's your name? Lisa and I'm Nandi. Um, so I, I've been really taken up by the idea around the sacred and around ritual. Um, and we know how complicated that conversation can be when we're talking about the setting of the museum and the artifacts that are in the museum that may have been either forcibly removed from their original sites or were not meant to be in public or to be seen by everyone. There are some pieces that a lot of people have said, you need to remove that because that does not belong there. And I was curious about your own process and what you are doing in making new rituals and making new sacred activities. Have you ever encountered space moments where there are things that maybe it might be too sensitive to share in the world? What are your strategies for that? in terms of working through these kind of rituals. And then um, more specifically, Ade Bumi. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was good. <laughs> I try. With a name like Nandi, you gotta try. Um, 
Lisa was asking about your work with the color blue and indigo and the meaning behind that and that kind of research that went behind that. If you could go into that a little bit. Thank you. It's fantastic. I want to push like kind of my research in like thinking about indigo further. Like I hope to go to like Nigeria and learn a dire with like Mama Nike or Guinea and just really expand upon kind of my understanding of um, this color, the ways it's been used traditionally, especially before the institution of slavery, because that is. Um, like kind of a material that, that we've known and dealt with for centuries. Um, but uh, I, I, I guess like I've just tried to approach it from so many ways, like just understanding historically, like how it came to such prominence because of, you know, royal families and the British. And um, it's really interesting, like being a, like art student, you you learn about these beautiful paintings and how like blue silk robes and stuff was a sign of wealth um, that you know like people would pose and wear the draped in these fabrics without the context of like what that meant. Um, you know why was blue so significant? Um, so I guess I've just been. Um, trying to explore and come at every angle um, of this color. I guess to answer your question about the sacred, and, and I don't know if I could like significantly answer that, but I think um, when you asked about things being really sacred and like kind of ha how do you share, like one of the, it took me a couple of years before even sharing that, like my work with memory and loss was partially because of my grandma, grandpa, uncle, and mom who passed. Um, and part of that kind of uh, delay in sharing that was also because I didn't know that for myself. It took me a while to understand that um, I was dealing through that type of loss. So I think um, sometimes that information <coughs> reveals itself in time to you. But I, I, I really have this strong belief that just my art mom always says, just do the work. Just do the work. Don't worry about the deadline. Don't worry about the show. Just do the work. Um, but I really believe in that, just doing the work and the ancestors and the energy and spirit reveal things, bring people to you, bring information to you over time. Um, and I, I just like strongly believe that. I don't know if I answered the question. That's great. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I can agree. I'll, I'll give a couple of specific examples of Bumi, Bumi where I have a, a people, dealers come to me and they say, oh, you know, the Astra, I, I got this object. Mm -hmm. um, but this, this brother in Chicago named Stuart came to me and he said, you know, I, I bought some objects uh, and one of the objects was a bowlie. Mm. And uh, it was a beautiful object, and so I took the bully home and uh, put it in my living room. And he said that one night he was away, his wife was pregnant, and his wife came into the room and it felt like the bully was alive, and that she felt, her body felt uncomfortable. And I said, the bully shouldn't have been out, and the bully, you shouldn't own it, and the bully should be buried. So he gave me the bully, um, and then the bully was in my studio. 
and the bowley was falling apart. This is a uh, kind of anthropomorphic bull-like figure that is made from the amalgamation of dirt and bodily fluid, biological fluid of all type, blood, semen, feces, the whole thing. And that, that every year this thing is compounded and compressed and it's an object used, some would say, in rites of passage for us. Uh, the bowley was falling apart, and I didn't know how to care for the bowley, so I called museological conservators. And they said, we cannot legally, within our profession, mess with this thing. All we can do is gauze the bowley and cover it. And so they wrapped the bowley in gauze to protect it from further decay. And uh, it was my attempt also to try to hide its native self. But I've decided that the bowley should never be seen again. And that I don't know enough about those rituals to feel comfortable benefiting from this form um, by treating it as if it's only a form mm -hmm. and that it didn't have other meaningful sacred intention. And there have been moments in the past where I've tried to access the maker of the bowling and ask their permission. And when I did that looking at the bowley, the bowley told me no. The bowley told me no. The bow it felt like the, the mouth of this thing, it's it's like a a hump. Like the body's like here. It's like a hump. It felt like it felt like this thing's this thing had energy mm -hmm. toward me. You know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not superstitious. Yeah. I felt this thing, and this thing was telling me, I'm not for that. I'm gonna listen to that thing. Yeah, it, it's so funny. I have a bowling mask in my studio, and I meant to take it home, but it's just in my studio, and I just, I feel like it. I, I don't know what to do, but it made me think of, you know, because I'm like gathering continuously soil yeah. Yeah. from a plantation and I can't ignore the fact that some of these bodies died in extreme violence. Mm -hmm. Like the things that happen on this land yeah. are some of the worst atrocities in humankind, and then here I am. Making cute look things. <laughs> we making and cute look I've things? experienced personally yeah. where I'll bring soil back. I brought soil back from Stony Bluff, and like my life turned upside down. Yeah. And I was in my house crying, and I had to call my god mom, and she was like, you just brought soil back from this space. Yeah. There's not only your ancestors and things like that, but those slave owners yeah. are in this, do this soil and they may not like what you're doing. Yeah. You know, so like there's times where I was like, I can't touch this earth right now. Yeah. I can't work with this here right now. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I, and, yeah. and I have to respect that. I know we got to close. I know we got to close. Okay, we're going to close. <laughs> but let me, just, let me just say this, that because I, I think it, this is like the uh, missionary Baptist Jesus believer in me. <laughs> that, that it means then that there is something shamanistic or priestly or there's, there is a, there, if we're going to mess with these materials, it means then that we have to be spiritually equipped. Mm -hmm. uh, and in some cases, we may need to be equipped in traditions that are completely native, uh, uh, foreign to us. Mm -hmm. 
uh, it right now. And I, I struggle with that all the time. Like, I am trying to make a translation between me and this thing. And I don't know if I'm doing it right. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I think that, you know, the field, in addition to having the object, then it's like, oh, we actually need the shamans. Mm -hmm. we, need, we need other, in addition to the historians, mm -hmm. we need other experts. And I mean, that again, that's why I'm so hard and that Dave's family is here. Because it means that the museum is willing to consider more deeply the thing beyond the object. It's the people connected to the thing. Mm. Anyway, thank you very much.